Uh, if you're joining us online, you're very welcome, uh, as, and we welcome uh, folks here in the building as well. Uh, and you're here because you've been engaging in our process of discernment, listening to God for our future here at Movilla Abbey Church. Um, and tonight is happening in response to a number of requests that we had through conversations and through your feedback forms. Um, requests to hear from our denominational leaders and requests to hear from people whose churches have gone uh, from being separate congregations to being a single congregation, both Church of Ireland and Methodist. So let's welcome our guests now. Uh, joining us this evening, we have Reverend Dr. Heather Morris, who's the General Secretary of the Methodist Church in Ireland. And we have the Right Reverend David McClay, who is the Bishop of Down and Dromore Diocese. <laughs> Reverend Claire Kakuri, a former member here at Movilla Abbey Church, and now the Minister of the Church of the Hill in Magabre. <laughs> and Mr. Colin Ferguson, who's one of the leadership team at the Church on the Hill, Magabre. <laughs> You're all very welcome. And joining us by video later on, Miss Claire Miles, a member of Movilla Abbey Church who's previously served uh, in the Church of the Resurrection in Belfast. You can talk for Claire too, yeah. <laughs> Claire will be watching later on, so thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Is my, is Are you my, on as well? Yes, it is. There you go. Some parts of the world began to slowly move out of this period of pandemic. Churches all over the world have begun praying for God to lead and direct in this season of significant change. And the kind of questions that churches are asking is, how can we best meet the new challenges of, of 2021 and going forward? How can we be best equipped to live like Jesus and love our neighbours? What lessons uh, have we learned through this, this period of, of pandemic and the resulting isolation and disconnection that people are feeling about what it means to be church and to reconnect with our society? Different churches will answer that question differently depending on their context. Now, for us at, at Mavilla Abbey Church, having fruitfully worshipped all together for every, every Sunday for over the last 18 months through, uh, through this period of restrictions, a key part of the question uh, for, for us is whether we should stay and commit to being one congregation, both Methodist and Church of Ireland together, or when restrictions permit to revert to two congregations, one, one Sunday worship gathering or two, one uh, leadership structure uh, or separate structures uh, that uh, we've had up to this point. What will make us most effective to join in God's mission? That's a key question. What will best equip for us to live uh, as disciples today and going forward? The last 40 years are important, but we're living today and we need to know what God wants for us today. So, so back in June, uh, we began a church-wide process of prayer and discernment. We had a month uh, of prayer, uh, a 24-hour prayer session, we laid out some detail in our vision day, which is still available to see uh, online if uh, anyone hasn't seen that. We published a, a frequently asked questions sheet, uh, and we circulated feedback forms to uh, every member of our two congregations. And throughout this time, Select Vestry and Church Council have been discussing and praying separately and together. And there's been many one-on-one -on -one conversations and group discussions amongst us all. And through this past four months, all of you have in, been invited to be part of the conversation and prayer, not primarily to find out what we all want or what we all think, although that's important to know how we're feeling, but primarily to discern where God mm -hmm. is leading us. What is the Holy Spirit saying to Mavilla Abbey Church yeah. in these days? So uh, let's begin with a, a question for our panel. And uh, uh, Heather and David, I'd like to address this first question to you, if, if that's okay. 
We've been on this journey of, of discernment here and asking particular questions about how we're to serve God at Mavilla. But we'd love to know what, what's going on in the rest of the island with other church, churches that are asking those questions about how they can best serve God at this time. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll lead off. I think, I think in truth, uh, it's a challenging season. It's a challenging season for churches everywhere. We've been through uh, a really difficult time where, where there's been, um, obviously, the whole COVID world has impacted families, it's impacted homes, it's him impacted every age group, it's impacted our children, our teenagers, our elderly. I think of you know, my, my own family. My mum uh, was out for lunch today with some friends for the first time in um, almost two years. Uh, and at a season in life where really it would have been wonderful if she could have been doing that this last year, particularly after my dad died and after my brother died. So it's been a, a difficult season for, 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 for everyone. Um, uh, but I, I think that what the church is asking today, how can we do mission best? How can we love people around us in a way that they can actually know that God loves them, experience something of his nearer, closer presence. So I find that everywhere I go, that people are beginning to ask some hard questions, some challenging questions, and, and are coming up actually sometimes with, uh, with, with, with answers that surprise them, uh, as well as answers that maybe uh, are, are going to lead to, to, to change as well for, for them in, in, in their particular church context. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a, a sense, uh, and I think as churches and as, as church families, we've been asking that uh, from the very beginning of the pandemic, which for me is a sign of, of the Spirit of God at work. You know, what does faithfulness to God look like mm -hmm. in this particular context as God leads us forward uh, in mission? And, um, well, let me start with encouragement. In, I think it was lockdown one, you were one of the examples that I was using when people asked that sort of question in terms of um, your, uh, your, uh, your work with um, uh, other uh, groups in this, in this town, uh, engaging with the community, offering help, phone line, whatever was needed, you were doing that. So you did that from the beginning. And, and that was certainly one of the stories that I was telling. As I uh, look at, at Methodism and a wee bit beyond it, I think, as, as Bishop David has said, I'm seeing people thinking, well, what are we learning here? And beginning to apply it. So as I look at Methodism, I think we've learned that we can change and change <laughs> quite quickly. And that's a surprise. Um, I've certainly been surprised by some of the things that God has done and by the things that God has used. And uh, that was a good reminder. So I will confess to you that when the possibility of drive-in services was named earlier on in one of the lockdowns, I really vented a wee bit because I thought that was very backward looking and what were we at and you know and look what God has done certainly in the west of Northern Ireland God has used those services for God's glory because people took a risk and tried it and wow uh, see what happened I think that we've learned that multi-generational things matter that um, being a people who love each other matter and the other thing that's come through again and again, as, as I have listened and watched, is the community piece. Um, getting to know our neighbours, whether that was doing the applause uh, on Thursdays, or and suddenly conversations happened that are now developing out uh, one family in, in Lurgan, uh, who some will know, who have found actually they've got to know their estate far better than they ever did. And now they're thinking, right, well, how can God use that? So as I look, I can see that desire, which is of God, to be faithful, and God beginning to plant those seeds and beginning to to, to stir, uh, mm. stir action. So it's a really challenging time, but yeah. there's something stirring. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Heather. Mm. Um, I suppose the, the other side of that is something that we've heard time and time again in conversations with people and in feedback forms, which is um, we've, we've just experienced so much change. 
Um, we've just experienced so much upset. We're unsettled by everything that's happened. We're, we're wrong-footed. Um, and our church is the one place that we can rely on um, to experience something familiar. Uh, mm. So why are you asking us to change? <laughs> and I think, I think all, of, all of us can relate to that, can't we? Mm. Um, we've, all, we've all felt that unsettledness in, in one way or another these past 18 months. We've, we've felt it deeply. It's not a, a trivial thing. It's a deep thing. Um, so at that time, why are churches around the world um, and Movilla particularly talking about change? Can I start that one? Um, you're right. Change is really, really hard. And um, I think that I echoed with what you said about um, about the pandemic. Um, I certainly felt it deeply around lockdown, that sense of, you know, when everything was changing around us, you just want you, want you and yours to be safe and secure. And, and that's a very basic thing and wanted things to stay the same, some sort of constancy. So let's admit that. Let's admit, as, as you are doing as a church community, that, that this is a tough time. Bishop mm. David started by saying that. We can admit that because we trust mm. God. Mm-hmm. And we trust that God <clears throat> understands that, promises God's comfort and God's leading. So one of the things that God's really brought home to me over this time is being led step by step. Change is hard, but God is the God we can trust who leads us step by step. Now that doesn't make it easy because mm-hmm. we all know that the next step can be tough. Mm-hmm but God's inviting us to take those next steps. And I think the other piece for me is that as we look at the pages of Scripture, change is part of the story of the people of God. Mm -hmm. And change is almost, well, isn't almost, is a constant in that story. God who's constantly leading God's people forward. Um, So recognizing that it's tough, we also are invited by the Spirit to recognize that God is the one who guides through change. And that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. David, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that COVID, one of the, the things that has happened this last 20 months is that um, we, we suddenly find ourselves now at this new sort of phase of coming out of where we've been and, and sort of looking back over a, a 20 month period. And of course, there's been a lot of change. And probably if you were to go around this room, actually, Michael, you would discover, uh, and you probably know this, both of you, that there's been change in probably everybody's life Uh, in this room. You know, probably all of us on this platform could cite significant change that has happened. Uh, And it's very natural for us to think, please, no more. Mm. But actually, if we stop to think about that for a moment, Uh, All the change that we've gone through this last 20 months, not all of it has been bad or Mm -hmm. painful or difficult. Mm. I think it's just that we tend to focus on the more painful and difficult bits because we we end up carrying those and and having to deal with those for maybe a a longer period of time, whether it's grief or or whatever it it happens to be. But I was just thinking about this today. I've had two little granddaughters born. Actually, they were both born on the same day, oh. two different mums, uh, uh, on the same day. And um, uh, so not all change is bad, actually. Right. Mm. They brought something really wonderful to, to us as, as, as grandparents. And I always said I would never be one of these grandparents that would have to talk about my grandchildren. <laughs> uh, and Here but, we are. But we are. the point that I want to make is this, that some change can be really, really good. Mm-hmm. Not all change is painful. Even two little granddaughters is challenging, but it's wonderful. Uh, and so in terms of embracing change, we do have to embrace change that sometimes is painful and, and hard and, and, and a journey. But sometimes actually there's change that we should embrace that is really going to bless us yeah. and bring a lot of joy and life and and healing for a long period of time. Not sure what I'm doing here. 
I'm doing know, something I'm, with I'm, my I'm sure, I'm sure our wizards at the back will sort that out, don't worry. Um, and it, it, that, that's one thing that we, we heard through feedback forms um, is um, if, you had, if you had a group of Jesus followers in 2021 moving into the Villa area, what would they do now? How would they, how would they shape their worship? How would they shape their mission? And there's that sense in which, yes, we're talking about change either as, either as two congregations or as one, but there's that sense in which it's um, kind of a fresh degree where we're bringing the riches of the past to do whatever it is God's calling us to do now. Um, I think it's worth addressing this. A few people have mentioned in, in feedback forums and in conversation, people have asked whether uh, there's any sense that this, this process is being imposed um, from above or whether uh, the Church of Ireland or the Methodist Church in Ireland hierarchies are, are instructing Movilla to become a single congregation. I think that's a, a natural question to ask. We've always answered that very directly and very clearly, but I think it might be helpful for some people to hear that out of your mouths. Um, and so for people to hear directly to you, are you or have you been directing this process? Have you instructed that this should happen? I've been a bishop for a very short period of time. My friends joked that I, they made me bishop and I managed to shut down the whole church in seven weeks. <laughs> we, went, we went into the first lockdown. <clears throat> I, I think I can honestly and unequivocally say that actually we don't have that authority to start with. Um, so the, the very clear answer to that, Michael, uh, certainly from a Church of Ireland perspective, we don't have the authority or our constitution wouldn't even allow us to do that, nor would I want to do that. And nor would we, I don't think anyone would want to do that. Thank you. From a Methodist perspective, um, absolutely not. So um, if, if it is the task of the local church to discern where God is leading them, and for anyone in any position to try and cut across that or direct that from a different direction would just be plain wrong, uh, let alone the authority question. Uh, it is the, the task of God's people here in this place to discern what is uh, the right way forward. Mm -hmm. um, one of the hats I wear is, is co-chair of the Covenant Council, which looks at, at these things. And it's important to say that that covenant relationship looks really different in different places. There isn't a sort of cookie cutter, this is the right way forward, because the Covenant Council lives that out, work that out. So let's be honest, in some towns and villages, there's no relationship between the Church of Ireland and the Methodist Church. And in others, in places like the Church on the Hill, there's a, there's a a united covenant congregation and everything in between mm -hmm. and far be it for anyone to direct the way in which a particular uh, group of God's disciples should go in this so no the Methodist Church is not directing this thank you Heather um, and Heather and David we know that you have been praying um, for every member here uh, as we go through this process of listening for God's leading and we appreciate your uh, your support very much um, as we go through the process. Um, the church should always be seeking God's leading and direction. Um, but we want to acknowledge that, um, that this process, our process, has not been perfect. Um, there have sometimes been um, words and meanings getting confused along the way. Um, for example, someone fed back to us that um, it sounded as though if you, if, you were, if you wanted there to be two congregations, that you were somehow being sinful or divisive. And if that's what you heard, we're very sorry. That is certainly not what was intended. Um, a number of people picked up on the ending of the letter that we sent out with the feedback forms. And it ended by saying, no matter what happens, we cannot go back to the way things were. And people read that and asked, well, does that mean that a decision has already been made? Um, that our feedback won't be taken to, into account or that it won't matter or that it's lip service in some way? Uh, and we're really sorry for that confusion. That was a, a miscommunication. Um, the letter that ended with that quote was quoting an article 
earlier in the letter. It was an article um, from the Church of Ireland Gazette, um, all about was what we've been hearing from Heather and David about the, the global response to pandemic for the church. And it was all about the church around the world allowing ourselves to be changed and challenged by God as we're shaped for mission in the world that we're living in now. And that's what we were referring to when we said we cannot go back to the way things were. We said that knowing that either two congregations in the future or one congregation in the future will mean challenge and change. Um, that's the reality. Whatever the outcome of this process, we all need to allow God to change us and shape us for mission and not just stay with what we've known. So it's certainly not the case that a decision was made for the church council and the select vestry. It has been a journey of prayerful discernment and listening to God and laying aside our own plans and ideas again and again and again. Um, do you have anything else to add to that? Okay. I think maybe just to add that there, I reckon there isn't a church on this island, maybe probably not in the world, that's going to be able to go back to where things were mm. in March of 20, whatever year it was, 2020. Um, there isn't a single church anywhere that's going to be able to go back. Life has changed. Some of the people who were around then are no longer alive. Mm. Uh, things are different. The world is a different place. Uh, there are new challenges. There are still lots of the old ones. So I, I think you're right, Michael. I, I don't think that for any of us we can ever very easily go back. Mm -hmm. Can I add in terms of, I absolutely agree with what David has said, and in terms of, of a process, um, let's acknowledge that a discernment process is tough, and that mm. there will be bumps in the road, and there will be, you know, misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what um, Colin and Claire are, are going to share, uh, but certainly talking to, um, uh, you know, to a couple of other churches where they've been on, on, on similar journeys, never the same, that there will be things. And you've been so thoughtful. And I think I've been so struck in terms of the process that, that you have been going through as a people, that it's been prayerful and it's about discernment and it's been biblically based. And you've been thoughtful in terms of thinking, well, what are the issues that are going to come up? And there'll be things you haven't even thought of. <laughs> that will come up as a, as a bump in the road. And it's that sense of discerning this together uh, as the people of God, trusting in God to, to lead you forward. Thank you. Now, we've been uh, a community here at the Villa Abbey Church uh, since 1980, when members of Regent Street Methodist and St. Mark's Church of Ireland came up here to plant a community. And for 40 years, we've, we've shared a building uh, and done church uh, in a certain way over uh, those, those 40 years. And uh, in this whole process of doing what God had done in the past and where he might be leading us in the on, on the feedback forms, and, and one person wrote on their feedback form that they, they've always thought of Mavilla Abbey Church as two congregations running along twin train tracks, and that's the way that they thought we should stay, but that even before we began this uh, discernment uh, process and this discussion of the church, they, they felt God speaking to them that we were now on one track. Now, I think, in, in a way, that's as good a description as any of, of why we've been on this process of, of listening to God. We've had some other comments uh, on feedback forms uh, around how coming together can happen. Uh, for instance, surely the only way to come together is to choose either Methodist or Church of Ireland, um, you know, for, 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 for one or the other. Or surely the only way to come together is to become non-denominational. Um, and most people here won't, won't have experience of uh, local churches um, that are, are both Methodist and Church of Ireland, that are, are fully both. Um, but in fact, there are three locally, as, as we've heard, the Church of the Good Shepherd in Monkstown, 
the church on the hill in Magabry, uh, from uh, which uh, Claire and Colin are here with us tonight, and the Church of the Resurrection, uh, which you also hear referred to <coughs> as the Hub uh, at Queen's uh, University. Now, each of, of these communities of Anglicans and Methodists have had their own journey, and each of them looks slightly different to the other in their context and how they express uh, their, their, their worshipping life uh, together locally. But it, it's, it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Claire and, and Colin here tonight from the Church on the Hill in McGabry because they, they've been through the process that we're now in, and we'd love to hear something from, from you two about your story. So, Colin, could, could I maybe ask you, first of all, in, in about five minutes, version of the story of the Church on the Hill? How, how did you end up uh, with a Church of Ireland congregation and a Methodist congregation sharing a building initially, like, like we have been, uh, now being one congregation together. We'd love to hear that. Well, first of all, thank you for the invite tonight, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and we hope that some of our story will be useful uh, for you in your journey. Uh, a little bit of history, I think, is always useful because it sets our, our congregation in context. 150 years ago, McGabry was nothing more than a townland, and at its centre was a crossroads, and on one corner of the crossroads, there was a school. On another one, there was a pub. And there was an, on another corner, there was an old Methodist hall. And it was said, of course, that you could get education at one corner, damnation at the other, and salvation on the other <laughs> corner. <laughs> so in 1877, this Methodist hall was built. And for the next 100 years, there were, was an afternoon Sunday school on and off and services on an intermittent basis. But by 1977, a hundred years later, that building was derelict. The witness was no more. And in fact, the, the local circuit of which we were part had decided to sell the building because they saw no further use for it. Uh, except they, didn't, they hadn't relied on the arrival of the Reverend Arthur Parker, who will be known to any Methodist, certainly here. And when he came to the circuit, he said, no, you don't want to sell the building. You want to renovate this and open it again. Because the prison had just been built in McGabry, about the only thing we're really famous for. <laughs> and uh, there were new houses had been started to be built there. So the, the, the old building was refurbished and opened in 1982, interestingly, in around the same time as Mavilla Abbey was planted. But it was a very small congregation, and although it was a Methodist church, it was actually made up of more Presbyterians uh, and other denominations who lived locally and didn't travel out of the village. But nevertheless, it was, it was a Methodist church, and there was a Methodist minister there. Now, McGabry sits in the, in the parish of Ahali. And the parish church was quite some distance away from, uh, from McGabry. So um, anybody who was Church of Ireland had to travel quite a distance to the parish church. So when the, the Methodist building was refurbished and opened, the then rector, Jim Harron, asked if he could use our building to have a Church of Ireland service for those parishioners who lived in McGabry and for whom it was difficult to travel down to the parish church. So for the next 20 years or so, the Church of Ireland met at 10 o'clock and the Methodists met at a quarter to 11. And we rarely, our paths rarely crossed. We had a, an annual harvest service together, which was more of a token gesture than anything else. But we really had no communication, no working together uh, of any real significance. Um, now, in that time, the Methodist, the, the, the church did grow. And in fact, we built a hall and we, start, we had started youth organizations. We had a BB and a GB. So things had actually started to grow. Um, but still, we were on our separate tracks. And then in 2004, um, the Reverend Simon Dugan, who is now in Valley Home, was appointed to Ahali. And uh, he and the Reverend Edmund McWhinney, who had retired but was working in McGabry, both had an interest in closer cooperation. And they began to... Uh, look at the idea of actually coming together and working uh, much more closely. And so we had started to have some combined services, now not on a regular basis, but just intermittently, we would have shared services together. However, that grew fairly quickly, 
And in 2006, the two congregations decided to permanently join for worship um, on a Sunday morning because the Church of Ireland loved the Methodist singing and the Methodists liked the increased numbers when the Church of Ireland joined. So at that point, it seemed to suit everybody. And uh, although we still had alternating services, so one Sunday we had a Church of Ireland service, the next Sunday it was a Methodist. And similarly with communion, we had Church of Ireland communion one Sunday, Methodist the next. Now that situation continued for quite some time. Um, and uh, in 2010 or so, we had... Uh, the, the situation had changed a little bit uh, for reasons which I'll, I'll talk about maybe later on. But we had a non stipendary Church of Ireland minister came to McGabry, Carlton Baxter. And because we in McGabry were part of a larger circuit with four churches, the Methodist minister in reality could only be there one Sunday in four. So in fact, we had a Church of Ireland minister uh, three Sundays, at least three Sundays out of four and sometimes more. Now, he adopted a very relaxed style of service, so it was not uh, in any way alien to the Methodist people who met there. So we actually fell into a pattern of a sort of a, a type of service that suited both denominations. Nobody felt uncomfortable with it. In fact, that progressed to the point where in 2013, we decided to join together because we were virtually worshiping as one congregation, um, we, we enjoyed um, each other's company, and we really began to see less of the differences between each other. There were new people, new families coming into the church who were neither Methodist nor Church of Ireland, but liked the style of worship, and they joined us, and our numbers started to grow very significantly. So it was a process over quite a number of years. Um, some could say it was accidental, but I don't think anything happens mm. uh, accidentally. Thank you, thank you, Colin. Uh, my, my microphone's uh, crackling, so using this one. Um, in, in terms of that, that process of, of, of coming together uh, from being completely separate to, to sharing things to, to, to being together, was there any pain in that process? Was, was it painful in any way? And if so, can you just tell us a little bit about, about that? I can't honestly say that it was a painful process. I think that it was painful for the devil because when he <laughs> discovered what had happened, I think there was probably a few questions asked somewhere along the way. But the whole thing was really characterized by a sense of excitement and anticipation in terms of what lay ahead of us because we had seen the congregation grow significantly. But there were, there were two stages in the journey that caused some anxiety. Uh, and some frustration, and, and maybe it's useful just to go over those a little bit, uh, which, which might be helpful to you. Um, towards, the 2000, towards the end of 2008, there was a new rector appointed to the parish of Ahali, uh, of which McGabry was still a part. We were not a se McGabry was not a separate parish at that stage. Um, now, this man was uh, less than enthusiastic about worshipping with the Methodist. And in fact, he took, in a very short space of time, took quite an unfortunate stance where he, he felt that the development and the growth in McGabry was threatening the, the mother church, the parish church, because the numbers were dwindling there. And uh, he felt quite threatened by that and decided that all the Church of Ireland should return to the mother church. And if they didn't, he wouldn't bury them in the graveyard. Now, that caused quite a lot of consternation, as you can understand, particularly among uh, elderly folk who many of them had spouses buried in the graveyard and were intending to, to be buried there themselves. So uh, that, that caused a, a, a lot of hurt. Um, but interestingly, out of that situation that could have been disastrous, the Church of Ireland people who were worshipping in the Gabri just dug their heels in and said, well, no, we're not going back. What we've got here is what we want. This is the way we want it to continue and to move forward. And they just refused to go. Uh, at that point then, um, things changed very quickly. The bishop intervened. McGabry was hived off as a separate parish. And at that point, the Reverend Carlton Baxter, well, he wasn't, yes, he was a minister at that stage, but he wasn't a full-time a full minister. He was appointed to McGabry. And that's how we arrived at that point. So, so out of a very difficult situation mm. and for what were, for some people was quite traumatic, um, 
there was a great sense of, of unity that came. Now, when, Carton, when the bishop phoned Carton back and said, I want you to go to McGabry, there's a bit of a problem there. Carton, and he, he talks quite openly about it now, expected to have to put his hard hat on and go in and deal with a really difficult situation. And he said to his amazement when he arrived, he found a people who were completely united. There was such a strong sense of unity that was beyond a, a personal desire just to get along with everybody else. And he said that could only be the Holy Spirit. So he, he was amazed by that. I mean, and, and he still talks about that mm -hmm. because that was an outsider who arrived and looked in on a situation that, that, could, that, that was very difficult, you know, particularly for some people. So out of that, we, we, we learned two things, uh, certainly. First, that I mean, the Holy Spirit can impart a desire for unity that is way beyond our own personal desire mm -hmm. just to get along with our fellow worshippers. <laughs> And, and secondly, and it's a rather obvious point, if you've got leaders who are committed to unity, it's so much easier. The second stage in our, uh, second stage in our journey that caused a lot of frustration, really, was when we had alternating services. Believe it or not, that was, that was uh, probably one of the stages that was most difficult because at that point, we still had two separate denominations um, they had their own hymn books, their own prayer books, free will offering envelopes, magazines, and, and so forth. Now, you can imagine if you arrived on a, on a Sunday morning in McGabry, you were handed a Bible, a prayer book, a Church of Ireland hymn book, a Methodist <laughs> hymn book, and a mission praise. So you ended up with a pile like this, uh, you know, and you were expected to balance this as you found a seat in the church. Um, and, and it just... It, it just wasn't very practical. And you can imagine what that was like for a new, a new member or a visitor coming to the church. They not only had to carry the books down, they then had to figure out which ones to use and when. So it just was not practical at all. The free will offering envelopes again created the difficulty because we had two separate financial systems. So you either had to contribute through one or the other. Um, which was all right if you already had envelopes, but we had new people coming to the church. So when somebody new arrived and said, oh, I'd like to join, I want to contribute to the church, well, they had to decide, do you want to become a Methodist or a Church of Ireland? And I had the embarrassing job of saying to them, well, you can have one or the other. Mm -hmm. So I remember one lady said, oh, well, what color is that? The Methodist, that's pink. That's my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what it was like. <laughs> But there were some even more difficult or embarrassing situations because the, the two denominations still produced their literature. And at one stage, we had a warden, who, um, the Church of Ireland warden, who was given the task of distributing Church of Ireland uh, appeal envelopes and literature and so forth. And uh, he would have gone round at the beginning of the service, just before the service started, and he would have distributed the magazines and so forth to the people that he was sure were Church of Ireland. And he would have walked along and he's looked at him, are you church? Oh yes, I think you are. And he would have handed one to them. But then he would have arrived at people and he was completely unsure. So in a fairly uh, loud voice, are you Church of Ireland? And uh, I said, no, I'm Presbyterian. Oh, well, you have one anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 just, it, it just highlighted you know, that division, which was completely, it, 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 was, it was a fact of the, w the way in which we were structured at that point, but it was unnecessary, it was clumsy, and it felt very mm. difficult for people who were new, who were coming to the church, who were not from either tradition, but who wanted to join. Uh, and, and so it, 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 didn't, it wasn't the best way to make people feel welcome. And thankfully, we moved on fairly quickly uh, from that into one, uh, one, denomin one congregation um, with one um, overhead projector, which had all the service on it. So we dispensed with all the books. Everything was up on the screen. And uh, we had one financial system, so there was only one envelope distributed, and everybody was treated the same, whether they were there for 20 years or whether they just arrived. Thank you. Um, Claire, what do you see as maybe some of the greatest strengths of being one congregation? And then we'll come on to challenges. <laughs> just forewarned, just forearm. So what are, the, what are the greatest strengths, first of all? There are certainly more strengths than what there are challenges. Um, although both do exist, it would be wrong to say otherwise. 
Um, I think in terms of the strength of us being one congregation, the big main obvious one for us is our witness. Um, so we are in a village situation, which is a little bit different from the context um, that you find yourselves in. Um, but in that village, there are only three churches. There's ourselves, there's an Elam church, which I think would be fair to say that a lot of people within the Elam church kind of travel in. There's not a lot of people from within the village actually attend the church. That's just how, how it is. And then there's a Roman Catholic church, which is only serviced um, key some you know key services in a year, mm-hmm. so it's not an active um, present congregation. So really, there only are the Elam and, and ourselves who are present in the village. So um, in terms of our witness and our outreach, it has just been such a significant move for us to be able to kind of show a united front and to show a, a really visible unity, and especially in in a in a culture and in a world where you often only hear of churches kind of fighting and arguing and dividing, mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of people are really attracted to the fact that here is a church that have chosen to come together and mm-hmm. have chosen to love each other and have chosen to kind of serve and to witness uh, together. People, you mean, don't always realize whenever they come, but whenever they come, mm-hmm. we're very quick to say that we are both Church of Ireland and we are Methodist. Mm-hmm. We are really clear about that. But people within the village, honestly, sometimes just see us as being the church in the community that is for the community, which is a really beautiful thing. And it's our heart as a church. That's what we want to be. And we want to be the church that is in the community and just for the community. But people, when they do come, we are really clear and really quick to say that we are I mean, both Church of Ireland and we're, and we're Methodist. That's our background. That's you know, where we're coming from. But, can, I, can I ask a, a question about that, yeah. Claire? Because um, one, of the, one of the conversations we've been having... I mean, uh, particularly after our 24-hour prayer day, unity came up again and again and again. Um, but unity is also something that we've experienced here. And we've experienced that witness on, in a way uh, when we do our community outreach events together, particularly light night in October, and people will often say, oh, year two congregations working together, that's marvelous. And uh, certainly when we had our Leaders' Day a couple of weeks ago, when we were looking at the fruit of a two-congregation future and at the fruit of a, of a one-congregation future, we were sticking unity on both sides mm. because both um, God is clearly calling us to unity and the question is what, uh, what flavor of unity, what shape of unity, what level of unity. So um, uh, you know, Colin's outlined for us various phases there in the life of of McGavery and times when it was kind of two working together and alternating and things, but you're saying that is there something is there something different about being one? Is that qualitatively different? I think there is, Michael, because I think we live in a, a world where there's a generation there's a generation of people who are unchurched and who just church isn't even on their radar. But for those who church is on the radar and who even choose to go to church and have been brought up in church. You mean there's a generation that actually denomination isn't important. And that's hard for us to hear, mm-hmm. who have been brought up in church and who are part of the church and who love our denomination and, and all the richness that comes from it. It's really hard for us to hear that. But that is, that is where we're at um, as a world. That, you mean, young people today, I used to say that about myself, I'm not young anymore, but you mean, <laughs> they're, they're just no longer loyal to denominations. Um, I see that in my friends. I certainly see it in the generations that you mean come after me. That they will they will choose to move churches because they can. You know, mm. you no longer go to the church that you can walk to anymore. You're active. You've got cars. You can travel. You can, and especially now, all the more so now in the post-COVID world in which we live, because you can access everything online. You can choose to watch what you want to watch, and if it doesn't scratch your itch, well, then you'll watch something else, don't you? You'll turn it off after ten minutes. But definitely there is a generation that they're just they're not loyal to denominations anymore so people will choose where they want um, to go and they will choose to go to a community i think that um are are real that are relevant um, in their worship and their teaching and are really building community and and showing you know love in, in the midst of all of that so i think there there's a there's a unity that comes from the fact that you I mean we're we're saying that actually we are, we are both Church of Ireland and we're Methodist, but first and foremost, we're a group of people who love Jesus. Mm. And we want to show that love, and that's, that's our priority. Mm. Um, and we, we love our history, we love our heritage of both the traditions, and, and we hold them tightly and dearly. But first and foremost, we are a group of people in a village who just want to say we love Jesus, and we want to show that love to you as, as, as the people who are around us. And, and I think that's a really attractive 
thing. Um, so that's, that's probably one big thing, I think, is a, is a, a strength that I would say we have. A couple of really you know, small, lesser things. Um, I think we've become much more mission focused just because of kind of the journey that we've been on. I think we've, we've become much more of a mission focused church, kind of looking out to the community, looking for ways that we can be reaching out to the community. Mm -hmm. I think we've, um, we're much more open to taking risks because let's face it, this is a massive risk <laughs> of coming together. Um, and I think as a, as a church, we're just much more open to those taking risks and, and trying something. And if it doesn't work, well, then it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's okay to try, and it's okay to try, and it's okay to fail. And, and not only is that something that we feel as a church, but it's something that is, is supported by the, the leadership of both the churches. That you mean, I've never heard anybody coming to me and saying, you know, if you try that and it doesn't work, well, then you're out of a job. But you know what I mean? There's, there's, a, there's an openness to, to try something new. Um, and certainly within our, with our, our church family, there's that, there's that openness. Um, like I have never heard, I've only been the minister of the Church on the Hill for four years, folks, so I am still really learning what this, what this is all about. Um, but I have never once heard, you know that phrase, this is the way we've always done it. Mm. I've never once heard that phrase. And it's the most freeing thing for a church leader, actually. Because, um, you mean, in previous churches, that's, that's all you hear. And it's just a really freeing thing. Actually, that's just a real openness to say, well, look, we're on a journey and God's leading us somewhere, so let's try. And if it tries and it works great, and if it doesn't, then, yeah. you know, look back to the drawing board and try something else. One other, just strength. Um, I often joke to people and never say, what's it like kind of being the minister of, you know, of our covenant church where there's two congregations or two um, denominations. And I say, well, that means I have two bosses, but since they're both sitting to my right, I'll be really careful, <laughs> I'll say. But, um, you know, that is, that is actually a real strength. Um, it can be a challenge at times, um, just to kind of dip into the next question, because... Um, sometimes there's there's paperwork and there's things that kind of come from the governance of both churches that you kind of look and think, oh, really, do I have to fill all this in twice? And do I have to go through everybody give them? And I've got to give it all to the other one too. So it can be a challenge kind of having both govern, governing bodies kind of and having that oversight. But it's also a real blessing because there is the support of both and it really is a supportive thing. Um, but there's resources there. Mm -hmm. and, and we have actually the wonderful privilege of being able to delve into the resources of, of both. Um, denominations and the support that is there and especially when it comes to things like children's work and youth work and um, we're able to draw from the resources of both yeah. and the wisdom of both and I have found that a really a really helpful thing actually. That's amazing and, and I think I don't know about you I certainly found that through pandemic absolutely that we were incredibly resourced and if you had an ear to the ground for some other organizations as well you realized that what we were getting was Mm -hmm. was really, really excellent stuff. I'm so pleased to hear you talk about mission and vision and, and outreach and all those things because that's why we're having this conversation. And someone had written in a feedback form something about, um, I just want to get on with it and stop talking about church politics. And I thought, oh, yes, <laughs> yes and amen. <laughs> and, and this has never been about politics. This is about partnership mm -hmm. and what our partnership looks like and what shape our partnership can be to best do the things that you're talking about. Um, You've talked there about, about one of the challenges that in, in terms of um, you know, we're supported by both denominations, but also answerable to both denominations. And so there's a bit of replication that can happen there. What, other, what are the other challenges? What are the, um, what are the extras and the things to watch out for? Do you want to jump in? Surprisingly enough, um, we have never, to my knowledge, had any issues around communion, the style of service, confirmation, baptism, money all the things that you would immediately expect to create some difficulties. Um, we just haven't had those difficulties. We haven't had those deep discussions that you would imagine uh, might take up hours at a, at a committee meeting. We have had long discussions on a bit of dust found behind a radiator and uh, <laughs> the, the, the mirror in the ladies' toilets. And uh, we, had a, we had a long discussion on whether we were church on the hill or the church on the hill. Oh, I'm so sorry. Which is it? Uh, well, we don't we, know. We actually, <laughs> we actually don't know. We tried to figure we, it out. We, we don't know. Which one's the Methodist we, one? We, we never reached a conclusion on it. So we're just, we're a normal church. You know, that that's tends to what you know, preoccupy people. All the other things that you would imagine create a lot of difficulty just just weren't weren't issues for people, um, and, and and didn't create a debate. However, I mean, we have had some issues. I mean, there are issues around the governance of the church. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, we we initially uh, when we came together 
had all the members of the vestry of McGabry Parish and all the members of the church council came together to form one governing body, which we knew would only be for a short period of time because it was just unwieldy. But we had one, one warden from the Church of Ireland, one Methodist steward. We had two treasurers, one from each. Uh, you know, so that everything was replicated so that nobody felt that they were immediately being uh, taken over. Now, that, that, that worked for a while, okay, and, and that got us over the initial period. And then um, we, we, I think, quite sensibly decided, well, look, this isn't the best way to do it. We will, we will streamline that and, and, and cut it down just to 12 people who will form the Covenant Leadership Council. But we, we soon realized that the role of a church warden doesn't necessarily mm. replicate what a society steward does. And so that has prompted us to look at, and this is an ongoing process, to actually look at the sort of roles that a church needs fulfilled for proper governance and how that can best be achieved. So we're not exactly rewriting the rule book again, but we are having to look again at, at those roles and the sorts of people that we ask to fulfill them. Um, Very much still an ongoing conversation for us, isn't ab it? Absolutely. We're still trying to figure those things out as we go along. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing I think that's worth saying is that a covenant church does not fit neatly into the administration of either, of either church. Um, you know, and so that does create issues from time to time, but nothing that can't be surmounted. Uh, sometimes it's a benefit to be able to fall between two stools because you can just ignore both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I told you not to say that. <laughs> they're, they're here, Colin. I don't know if the screen is opaque for you, but um, we, 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 asked the, um, we asked the congregations here what they felt we might lose by coming together. Um, and one person wrote, I hope that all we would lose will be empty seats as more people join us. Has that, has that been your experience? Honestly, yes, it has. <laughs> um, I think there is a real blessing that has come from, from our unity together, for sure. I think we can do far more together than, than what we could have done in our context apart. You know, we were two small congregations. Um, so certainly by coming together, we can do far more and achieve far more in terms of our mission and our outreach um, into the community. So for sure that has been the case. We have seen numerical growth, um, bums on seats, to coin a phrase. Um, you know, I've said we, we are in that unique position where there's not a whole lot of churches in the area for people to choose from, um, but people could choose to go out of the village and, and do. Um, so if people choose to come to us, well then, I mean, that's, we, we just, are so thankful for that and we see that as being a real blessing and certainly as it stands now like our congregation is made up of we have a, certainly a retired rector we have an ex-president of the Methodist Church and we have a former leader of this Christian Fellowship Church we have a Presbyterian elder we have several members of the Roman Catholic Church that are um, are there there's Pentecostals that come and worship with us there's Presbyterians there's a Baptist too maybe and then there's Church of Ireland and Methodist <laughs> so we're, we're a real kind of conglomeration of people that have chosen to come and, and to do life together but I would say that you know the unity that we have is a real God-given unity and I joke sometimes I pray every day that I don't mess it up but that is that is so true because there is a real God is doing something really beautiful and I don't want to mess up what God is doing because there's a there's a beautiful unity that's there that is really attractive to people so we have seen numerical growth um but there is also, I think, we have to acknowledge that, that there is, for some people, there's going to be a loss. But I think those losses, um, I, don't, I don't want to say they're of lesser importance because that makes it sound as if I'm, I'm saying that what you're, what you're letting go isn't important. But they're, they're not the big issues. That, um, they're, they're more be more our preferences and our wants and our likes <laughs> that we're having to let go of if we want to come together and, and do life together. So we're going to be letting go of our personal preferences in favour of, of showing that love for, for each other. And I was trying to think about it. You know, I think the image that I have that comes to mind is um, I have two girls. Um, and I remember when one of them um, was, was younger, she was kind of holding this half-eaten biscuit that she had found on the floor that was covered in dog hair. Um, and she didn't want to let it go. She wanted to eat it. And I was trying to convince her to let it go. 
um, because I had something much better for her. I had a clean biscuit or, or a treat or a bun or something. But in order for her to receive what I wanted to give to her, um, she had to be willing to let go of what she had in her hand. And would she do it? Not in your Nelly, because no three-year-old's going <laughs> to let go of a biscuit. But sometimes there's that bit of that child in all of us, um, that we don't want to let go of the things that, that are important to us, the things that we like and the things that we want. But sometimes God is asking us to do that because he has something bigger in store for us. And that's been our experience, I think, at the Church in the Hill, that there's been times whenever people maybe have had to let go of their personal preferences for things. But God has been able to bless and bless abundantly. Mm. Um, and you mean, all my, all my three-year-old could see what I was asking her to give up. She couldn't see what I was um, going to give to her in return. Um, and sometimes that's, that's where we're at. But I would say that we can never, like, we can never outgive God, folks. Mm. <laughs> um, you know that. Um, whenever you know, we give and whenever we let go of something, you know, if, that, if it's what God's calling us to do, yeah. and if we're obedient to that, well then, you know, the blessing that comes is just immeasurable. And that's, that has been our experience, um, that, that there's just been such a blessing that has come from it. Um, you, you're calling to mind for me one of our, our missional commitments in the Methodist Church in Ireland, which, Heather, you'll keep me right on the wording here, but uh, one of our missional commitments as Methodists in Ireland is um, to live as though we want children and young people to be part of yeah. our congregations, even if that means making difficult choices. Yeah. Mm. Um, and and it. so it's those things sometimes we have to be willing to let go of. Having looked in at Church on the Hill, and you, you have a very particular approach to sort of families and family ministry. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think we've, we've, that's, that's changed mm. as, as we've gone through this kind of COVID pandemic. Um, we've always tried to be a, you know, a very family-friendly church, as, as most churches are. You want to be welcome into families and bring families in. Um, we've always had a really strong um, children's and youth ministry there. Um, so Messy Church has kind of been one of the biggest outreach things that we've had into the community. We've seen lots of young families that have come in through the, the new ministry of Messy Church in particular, um, through like mums and toddlers and things like that, just trying to have an open door policy and you know be community and show love in action. But certainly in, in the kind of our response to COVID, um, um, we have worked really hard to try and keep in contact with our children. But when it came to trying to bring people back into church, we, we don't have anywhere like the facilities that you guys have here. Um, so when it came to trying to do Sunday school again, we just don't have the space to do it and do it safely under, mm. under the COVID regulations as they stand. So our approach was just to kind of, we're all going to do it together. We're all going to do church together and that's going to be messy. Yes, it's going to be noisy. Yes. Um, but where there is noise, there's life. And so that's a tension that, you know, we try to manage uh, on a Sunday morning. But, you know, if you ch it doesn't actually come across always on the, in the camera because we sometimes watch our service and like, it doesn't come across what actually in reality is the noise levels that happen in the building. Because thankfully it only picks up my microphone and doesn't always pick up what's going on in the room at the time. But, you know, it, it, we keep everyone together. That's, that's how we're doing church at the minute. And um, we're looking at how we can begin to kind of bring people back um, into Sunday school and so on. But at the minute, we're all in the room together. It's very much intergenerational. It is very messy, but it's also very beautiful. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, we've had to evolve and change, I think, how we've, our approach to doing sort of stuff since yeah. COVID, but we've always tried to include children. I think whenever I arrived at the Church of the Hill, I arrived with a, a one-year-old. Um, my Anna was maybe six, um, but we had a one-year-old in our arms. Um, so that, you know, I mean, we were looking at from, from our context as, as somebody arriving in with two young children and looking, could immediately see the things that think, gosh, this isn't going to work for us. And Michael was kind of thinking, Ooh, you know, you're not going to ask me to try and keep kids in this context. And so we were immediately began conversations with like, well, maybe we could change this and maybe we could move this and kind of create, create a space in the back that where toddlers could go and so that the parents will still be in the room and still hear the service. Because my husband was saying, Claire, if I'm going to go and sit in a, in a room Mm -hmm. by myself with you mean one year old I might as well stay at home <laughs> um so you know, we, we immediately started trying to look at how we could make the space just family friendly and family focused and that everyone could be in together and we've been so thankful you know, I mean I've been so thankful that actually as a church as we've been going on that journey um there has been that open it's not that there hasn't been tension sometimes it's noise and people you know 
then it's just it's too much. But then we'll move you know we're to the front again we'll keep yeah. the kids in the back. You know you you, you manage those tensions because yeah, where well, there's noise, there's life. And yeah, thank you, thank you, Claire. Um, one one of the questions that has has come up through this this whole process as as we've reflected upon who we are as a church and what God might be calling us to be, to become is is that of our identity. Um, we we talk about. Uh, a Church of Ireland identity or a Methodist identity. Claire, you, you made it very clear a moment ago that at, at McGabry, you're both uh, mm, uh, Methodist you and, and Church Church of Ireland. And, and of course, those identities mean different things to different people. Now, now you were raised Church of Ireland, uh, Claire, you're mm. a Church of Ireland minister. And Colin, uh, you're a dyed-in-the-wool uh, Methodist uh, in terms <laughs> of your, your upbringing uh, 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 and so on. So as we think about that whole question of, of Church of Ireland and, and Methodist identity, which, which is important for, 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 for people, has becoming a, a single congregation strengthened or weakened those, those connections for you? Could you say a little bit about that? Well, the Methodist Church uh, is constantly evolving. I mean, it just reflects the changes in society. Uh, and the Methodist Church that I grew up in um, is worlds apart from the Methodist church that I worship in today. Um, and therefore, you know, the question is posed, well, does, is your identity changed? Um, I now have a dual identity because I am both a member of the Methodist church and the Church of Ireland. And, and, and I'm very proud to be able to say that. But my identity is first as a Christian. Uh, that's more important. Uh, and it's more important to me to identify with a vibrant congregation rather than simply identify as a Methodist in a declining congregation. So my identity has only been strengthened by all of this. There has nothing been taken away from me personally in terms of my identity. I mean, I now represent our church on the diocesan synod, something that I would never have imagined that I would have been able to do or indeed would have wanted to do, but I'm very proud and happy to be able to do that. Um, but our Methodist identity hasn't been diluted. We still have local preachers who, when Claire's not there, can fill in. We have lay readers. We have our Methodist covenant service every year. So that's something that our Church of Ireland friends Maybe some of them never expected mm. to be able to take part in a Methodist covenant service. So both have gained from the process. And mm. I, I don't feel in any way that our identity has been somehow diminished or obliterated because of the, because of the coming together of the two congregations. That's really interesting. Thank you, Colin. Claire, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, pretty much what he said. <laughs> um, I think I would say just with, with, a, with a church kind of leader hat on, first and foremost, um, whenever I became the minister of the Church in the Hill, I made a commitment um, straight away that I would do everything I could to make sure that both identities um, were held. Um, you know, we, we, we love the, the, the tradition and the history of, of, of both denominations. Um, and in order for there to be an authenticity in what we do, I mean, that, that needs to be maintained. So I have worked really hard um, to, to, to maintain those two identities. Um, even though I am a Church of Ireland minister, um, I have worked really hard to attend every Methodist meeting that there is. <laughs> um, and you know, the district meetings, that I'm, I'm there at them so that our church is represented at them. Um, I also then, uh, obviously, I'll attend our own Dallas and Synods and that. I'm a, a representative of the Methodist Conference so that you know, our church is, is, is there and is represented. And, and we work really hard to do that. And I think that's really important um, you know, going forward, I think it's, it's really important that whoever comes after me, that that is something that is maintained because we do have two identities and they could quite easily fall into becoming more one than the other or becoming nothing <laughs> um, if that's not maintained. Mm -hmm. So it was something that I was really aware of and, and have worked really hard to try and do it. I don't always get it right. Um, I know that, but I, I mean, I, I work really hard to try and you know, maintain those connections with both. But just personally, um, you know, I am Church of Ireland. Um, I was born and raised here. I was born in 1980 and baptised in this church in my villa. My maiden uh, name is Ashbridge, for those of you who have been here from day one. Yeah, you will you know, know our family. Um, so I, you know, I have a, love, a real love for this place <laughs> because this is the place where I first heard about Jesus. I sang in the mm -hmm. choir. <laughs> this is where I first heard about <coughs> Jesus. Um, uh, so I love the Church of Ireland. I love our, our background, our, our heritage, our traditions. 
but my first love is Jesus. And my primary identity, I call him, you know, my primary identity is as a child of God. Um, so has it lessened my identity? No, <laughs> it hasn't. Um, there's been a richness that has come um, because not only do I have the, the, the background and the riches and traditions of the Church of Ireland, but I've learnt so much about the background and the riches and traditions of the Methodist Church um, as I have been, you know, because uh, the other thing I, I do work really hard to try and do is to, um, you know, the key kind of services within the, the church year for, for both um, denominations that we try to, to uphold those. So we do have that covenant um, service at the start of every year. And there's lots of things like that within both. Um, but particularly for me, kind of as a church of Ireland, I have learned so much. And I think there's so much richness and wisdom that has come from the method of church that I am just so thankful for. And it doesn't make me any less church of Ireland um, to be able to say that. But there's, there's a real richness in both. And there's a real blessing that comes from being able to kind of walk that path, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Mm. One of the things that comes up uh, when people talk about a Methodist identity or a Church of Ireland identity is worship, um, mm. specifically what our Sunday gathering looks like. Um, so, Claire, you preferred a, a little bit to that, and I suppose it, to all four of you, um, anyone who wants to say anything to those who fear losing um, a preferred or familiar or precious style of gathered worship. Anything you'd say to those folks? Maybe, maybe, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe to say, uh, you know, both denominations are, are, are broad, actually. You know, mm. certainly we in the Church of Ireland are incredibly broad. Um, you know, you will go into one Church of Ireland church and there'll be a lot of liturgy. Uh, you'll go into another Church of Ireland church and there'll be some liturgy. And you'll go into some, and there'll be very little liturgy. Uh, we're we're a pretty broad church, um, and I think the Methodist Church is, is a pretty broad church actually, as well. I, I, I think it was said earlier. I think it was Claire that said earlier that actually for a younger ge- generation, uh, the denominational labels don't matter a lot, and I think that's very very true. Something that some of my generation maybe find more difficult to actually really own up to and acknowledge, but it's the reality that my children, uh, if they move to another area, uh, and I can think of loads of their friends who have done that, and they haven't gone looking for a church of a particular denomination, but they've gone looking for a church with particular characteristics. And then we've got to recognize that out there in society, most people actually are, are unchurched or dechurched. Uh, and we have the command of Jesus to reach them. And, and that really has got to be at the very, very, very top of, of our agenda. When it comes to, to worship style, um, you know, there is a richness, and this is not just a cliched say, thing to say. There is a richness in, in both. Uh, we need uh, to, to really, whether churches are united in the way that you're considering or not, actually, we, we need to learn to, to avail of that richness. We desperately need that richness. I I'm, wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't have attended a, a Methodist service where the Reverend Jim Ray was preaching and, and where at the end on the way home I, I gave my life to Christ and, and was nurtured in those early days um, uh, through both the Church of Ireland and the Methodist Church, a chap that probably very few of you have ever heard of, a chap called Billy Abraham. <laughs> uh, really uh, impacted my life in those early years. And, and, and there's a richness in all of that, that actually I, I long that every Church of Ireland church would embrace mm. and would own and would make its own. So in terms of worship style, you know, it really, what we, what we need is uh, something of the otherness and the, and the presence of God that will just transform people's lives when they come into his presence. Amen. 
And, and that, I think, is, is what we need to be chasing after and uh, going for uh, in these days. Amen. Always, right. actually, in every age. I mean, as, as I listen to your question, uh, Michael, you know, part of me is really glad that, you know, that worship is precious to us mm -hmm. because, you know, God, uh, you know, so graciously uh, has moved as we have offered all we are to, uh, to God in worship. So thank God for that. Thank God it matters. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that was going through my mind uh, was that, you know, there are very few churches that don't grapple with worship Absolutely. style. You know, whatever denomination or tradition, most churches are grappling with that. Well, maybe as I've listened to Colin and to Claire, you know, in a, in a context where, where you are discerning about being together, there's one of the, the benef potential benefits of that change that David was alluding to earlier, that you are explicitly resourced by broader resources than either denomination in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think just in terms of just be really practical about it, um, you know, on a Sunday morning, I just try to do a, a blended approach. Probably is the, is the best way to word it. Obviously, I mean, I was I was more familiar with the Church of Ireland liturgy because that's what I was born, brought up in, raised in, and worked in uh, for the first you know ten years I was ordained before I you know I moved to the Church in the Hill. Um, so what we do now is just a really blended approach of, of the richness of, of both traditions, um, but to be really practical about it. You know, we, we always will have a confession and we'll always have a creed in there because within the Church of Ireland tradition, you know, that's, that's really important. So that, you know, there's always a confession of some sort. There's always a creed of some sort, unless the minister forgets, which does sometimes happen. Um, and then, you know, we, we, the rest of the service is, is, is flexible. It's based within the service of the word. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there's a, there's a framework there, and within that framework, there's a there's a flexibility for it, and it means then that visiting preachers who would come in whenever you know I'm not there, if I'm taking some time off, whatever, well, then they're given that framework, and they're asked to kind of make the service their own within that framework. Um, so you know, somebody else just doesn't come in and suddenly do a full Church of Ireland service. You know, what I mean, with every canticle going, um, you know, there's a framework that people work within, and um, that's kind of handed to them. And, I mean, we try to make the service as, as, as available and as, attra I mean, as available to people who are outsiders coming in. So everything is, I think Colin alluded to that earlier, everything's up on the screen, so you're not having people who raft the books and telling them to kind of find their way through. Everything's up on the screen. But, I mean, I'm really careful kind of with family, families that come in that, I mean, I take the time to sit with them and not only explain kind of a bit about our background and who we are and where we're coming from, but also explain the practical things like communion and how we do that in our context um, and what that looks like and talk people through that, talk people through, you know, baptism um, or a service of Thanksgiving and what that looks like. And, and you know, so you're just constantly talking and explaining people through um, what we do and how we do it. Um, but a blended approach is probably the best phrase I can use to describe um, where we're at and what we try to do. In the village of McGabry, there are still quite a number of Church of Ireland people and Methodist people who travel out to other churches because that's where their connections are, that's where they have traditionally gone to. And we are not so much concerned about those people or trying to make our service attractive to them. We want to make it attractive to the people who don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if we hold on to something that makes it difficult for those people to find a way into our church. And that's something that we've got to look at and say, do we need to hold on to this? Is this something that's so vital that prevents people or makes it difficult for outsiders to come in? I heard a story one time, a, a, a very brief, I think it was at a Bishop's Bible Week, so it must be true, um, <laughs> of, a, of, a, minister, of, of a, a, a minister who was training other young ministers who were just coming in um, to, to, that, to respond to that call to ministry. And at, at one session, he said, I'm going to give you a five pound note and I want you to go out uh, into the town and go to a bookies and put a bet on and come back and tell me how you got on. And most of them sort of looked at him and thought, Craig, I've never been in a bookies shop. You know, what do you do? 
you know, where do you find the bookie shop? I've, I've never been to one, so I would struggle to know where you actually go to. I have a vague idea how it works, but I don't know how you actually go in. You know, you, there's a mass of television screens. How, how do you know which race to pick? What do you say? What's the right language to use? Who do you give your money to? What, t what do you do with the ticket you get? How do you know if you've won anything? And when they came back, of course, they relayed all these stories to him. And he said, well, that's exactly how people feel mm -hmm. when a stranger comes into a church. We know what to do. We know when to stand up, when to sit down, what book to open. But people who've never been in church before don't understand all of that. And if we make that difficult for them, the chances of them either coming in in the first place or staying when they do come are reduced by things that we hold on to that are not absolutely necessary. I think as well, if I can catch one again, um, in, in all our churches, we, we really, I'm, I'm passionate about this, I can't stop myself saying this, um, we really must prioritize the, the generation that's my yeah. children's generation. We really must. And um, I love to tell the story. When my kids were teenagers, my mother-in-law every Sunday almost had us for Sunday lunch. One of my children uh, decided that she was only ever going to eat chicken. And the other decided as a teenager she was going to be a vegetarian. And of course, then I, I love uh, my beef on a Sunday. And uh, so my mother-in-law would cook three different <laughs> things on a Sunday. And I remember saying to her one Sunday, Margaret, this has got to stop. This is just not fair. This is just not right. And she looked at me and she said, indeed, it will not stop. I want my grandchildren to look back at their teenage years and remember that they loved going to grandmother's for Sunday lunch. And we really need to have a culture, and it's about culture, I think, that our children and our teenagers and our young adults actually love to be in this place, love to be in all of our churches uh, because because it works for them. And that might mean some sacrifices for an old guy like me. Uh, and uh, so, you know, but I, I really would appeal to us, whatever we do, to actually prioritize uh, in every aspect of our lives the generation that's my children's generation. Teenagers, those that are young adults, um, Dare I say, Michael, your, your generation <laughs> I'm, I'm and younger. Okay. Uh, we really must. We really yeah. have got to do it, folks. We've got to do it. We've got to make that our priority. And we should see it as our privilege and our joy to do that. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't stop no, myself. You're right. You're, right. No, you're, you're fine. Um, you, you've kind of already asked, answered uh, sort of, my next uh, question, uh, Claire and uh, Colin, which was which all about which is all about how you set the tone for Sunday worship as as uh, one uh, as one as one congregation, both Church of Ireland uh, and Methodist. I mean, we've certainly been on a journey over this last eighteen months as we have sought to worship together, uh, and uh, it, it's been a very fruitful journey. As, as we've shared resources in terms of people and, and ministries. And I think it's blessed a lot of people. Now, but we'd be the first to admit it's not been perfect uh, in trying to please everybody. That's, that's not always easy to do, is it? But um, is there anything else you, that you could say or would like to say about uh, how you set the tone for worship uh, in a church that is both Church of Ireland and, and, and Methodist? Um. I think we, we try to walk a, a middle path, if that's, you know, if you understand what I mean, like we're not, you know, I don't, I wouldn't sit down and, you mean, try to put a service together that is, you mean, overly Church of Ireland or overly Methodist. I mean, we just try to have a blended approach that we're, we're walking that middle ground. You don't want anyone from any tradition to feel that. And I think maybe I felt it more as a Church of Ireland minister coming in that I didn't want the Methodists that, you know, were there to thinking, gosh, here she is, and she's just imposed like, the, the full liturgy on us. Whenever that, but that was never the tradition of the Church of Ireland congregation in, in McGabry. Um, there was always a more relaxed, more informal um, service there, you know, I mean, prior to the two coming together. So whenever it came together, there actually wasn't a massive difference between the two. 
um, because the Church of Ireland always had that kind of relaxed worship. So I guess I've been really careful. I didn't, you know, necessarily take the church back to those, you know, back a step to having a really liturgical service because it was not there to begin with. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but it, it wasn't part of the culture of the church whenever I arrived. So I've been really careful in kind of how we've put our service together that, that we do stick to more of the structure of the service of the word um, where there's a flexibility in that approach. Um, but as I say, there's, there's key things that are always there. So there's always the confession, there's always the creed. Um, there's always obviously a Bible reading, there's always obviously prayers. <laughs> um, but just in terms of sometimes how we do that, you know, there's a bit of flexibility in, in, in terms of how we put it across. And, and we try to, especially because at the minute we do have all of our children in that space um, with us. Um, and so the families that right now sit together around tables, if you can imagine that we, we, we worship essentially in a sports hall. We outgrew the church quite quickly. Um, so now every Sunday we're in our sports hall, which is why we don't have space for Sunday school. Um, and around the outside of the building there are tables. Um, and families who come, come as a family. They sit around those tables, if you can kind of visualize that. And then in the middle of the room, there's the rows of chairs put out for um, the adults to sit on. And so in terms of what I'm doing now on a Sunday morning, I am trying to think of a craft activity or something that the kids can be doing with their families around the tables that completely ties in to whatever theme the, the service is um, for that Sunday morning. And then I'm kind of designing the service in terms of the prayers and the readings and, and you mean know, the everything around that theme so that whenever families are coming in that you know the kids have their activity baskets on the tables that has play-doh and lego and things like that on it that they immediately run to and start doing but then as the service comes on I'll give them a challenge what to do with their with their play-doh and I'll say well you mean in the reading today there's this and I want you to make me this or I want you to build me something with your lego and they're you know they're busy doing that and you know, the parents are getting involved in it too, and you know it's chaotic some days and it's messy some Sundays, but but it works um, for us in our context right now. But in, in all of those things, I'm just constantly trying to walk that. If you can, you know, if you use your train track analogy. If, if we're all, if we're on the one track, um, and there's, I mean, the Methodist tradition and the Church of Ireland tradition, and they're both going, um, you know, two sides of that railway line. Well, then I'm constantly walking up and down the middle, making sure that we're not going overly one way or overly the other. Um, so you mean we, we try to balance things out all the time, like even in, in terms of our approach as a church to, to our finances. You know, I mean, there's a, you know, within the Church of Ireland, we have the Bishop's Appeal. Um, you know, I mean, within the Methodist Church's home mission, and we always kind of make sure we are, we're balancing that out, that you mean, it's not all one and, and none of the other. Um, in terms of you know, key Sundays in the year, you know, it's important and it's right that, that the, the richness of both traditions are kept. So, you know, the covenant service is there and is celebrated and it's celebrated by everybody. Um, and we have grown to really love that service. Um, and equally then, if there's something within the Church of Ireland, you know, a key Sunday that's coming up, well, then we're going to celebrate that and we're going to promote that. Um, you know, I, we, we kind of have a balance in terms of what we promote. We don't want to be promoting everything in Church of Ireland, you know, or everything in the Methodist Church. We try to, you know, kind of be promoting the key things in both. And that means we can't do everything. And that needs to be said, you know, there's some things that whenever the emails come through, I just have to say, well, that's, that's not, we're not going to do that in, right now because that's not for us. Um, because we couldn't do everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or every single Sunday, there would be, <laughs> there would be something happening. Um, but I, oh, we try to pick and choose carefully so that we're being balanced in our approach. Um, and that's very deliberate and very careful. But on a Sunday morning, I think in terms of what we do practically, um, we're trying to just take that balance of, of honouring what has gone on in the past in Magabri, mm -hmm. um, honouring the past, but also looking to the future and saying, well, what's God calling us to do now? And in this season, you know, that involves us looking a bit messy <laughs> because we have everyone in the one space and the kids are there and everything. But that won't be forever. I mean, there's something else that God's calling us to in the future. So we're just constantly looking and saying, well, you know, what's God calling us to do now? Mm -hmm. And how can we do that well in a way that honours him? as well as honouring the denominations of which we are a part. Thank you, Claire. It's really interesting as we've listened. I don't know what you find, folks, but I think we can certainly hear some similarities and some differences with McGabry, even just as much as we've got similarities and differences with Regent Street Methodist and St. Mark's that we were planted from, you know. Um, but there's that sense that we're all kind of branches of the church family. And I think at Mavilla Abbey Church, the idea of church family is a real core value for us um, 
And, and something that I've heard from people in conversation um, that, that really breaks my heart to hear is um, I fear that if our congregations become one, that the family that I have in my own congregation will be lost. I've heard that from a few folks, and it, make, it makes me... Uh, it makes me so sad because I think we can, under, we can all understand the depth of those relationships that build up over the years, um, the shared stories, everything that goes into that, and, and even the idea that those things would be lost is just is so sad. So is that something that was a fear in McGabry? And perhaps more importantly, is that something that happened? Did those friendships break apart? I think it was probably a fear that may have been there on the part of some people, but we were two relatively small congregations. So the, the, the groups, if you like, would have, been, would have been relatively small. And because we all live in, or in a near a village, um, People had those connections already across the denomination. Either they were neighbours or they sent their kids to the BB or the GB. Um, you know, so, th so they had those connections already across the denomination. So any, any groups that were there, any um, sort of tightly knit units, were simply expanded by the arrival of new people. Um, and, and the, the, the links that were made there so that the, the, there were no longer two women's groups. They came together. So there, there was a, you know, a, a much bigger unit there with a, with a stronger bond between them. So I can't say that, that, that those units uh, were diminished or that people felt they had been cut off. Um, you know, I think it's worth remembering that we're, we're 10 years, almost 10 years down the line of having... Um, combined worship, and that uh, on any Sunday morning, well, certainly at the current, uh, in the current services that we have, up to a third of the congregation have only who are there on a Sunday morning have only joined in the last few years. Mm. So that you know, those are the people who, in ten or fifteen years' time, when the minister tries to bring in something new, will be saying, "But we've always done it this way." Mm. <laughs> You know, so you forget that time moves on and that people make new friendships and new groups are formed and new relationships made. But we certainly, I, I certainly haven't detected that that has been in any way a problem for people. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that's good to hear. And actually, a, a few people uh, on the feedback forms that we received uh, express that they thought a, a potential gain of our coming together would be new friendships, new people to have fellowships with, uh, and, and, and learn from. So it's encouraging to hear that's been your experience and should that be the direction we, that, that we travel, it would be good uh, for, for that to be our experience as well. Now, someone who wanted to very much be part uh, of this conversation tonight is Claire Miles. Claire is a, a member of our church here. She's part of our, our Methodist Church Council. Uh, she's worshiped here ever since she was a child. But whenever she was at, at university, she lived and worshipped and served as part of the Church of the Resurrection, a united Church of Ireland and Methodist congregation based at Queen's University, Belfast. Now, Claire wasn't able to be with us uh, here uh, tonight, but Michael caught up with her during the week and asked her about her experience at the Church of the Resurrection. So if you'd like to look at the screen, we're going to uh, listen and see Claire now, hopefully. Hi Claire. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, who are you? Um, I'm Claire. I'm a children's nurse. I'm a member of Novella Abbey Church and just recently joined Church Council. I don't know what else you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and how long have you been part of Novella Abbey Church? 23 years. Was born and raised here. Okay, so this is home really? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we're not here to talk about Mobile Abbey Church, we're here to talk about uh, another church that you were part of, and uh, where was that and how did you get involved? So I went to Queen's University to study and 
whenever I was in second year, I decided to move into Hub, which is the Christian accommodation run by Methodist and Church of Ireland Chaplaincy. And they also then have a church joined on called Church of the Resurrection. Mm -hmm. And it is a Methodist and Church of Ireland joint congregational church. And so from moving into Hub, I then got involved in the church and just when I was up at weekends and very often then started going to their services. Sure. Um, So um, there's two things there. There's there's the hub, which is people hear both these names. So there's the hub, which is the the chaplaincy. And then there's the Church of the Resurrection, which is really the congregation, which is attached to the chaplaincy. And they're they're just like that. Yeah. So I guess like heading off to university, starting a new church is an experience lots of people have. Um, I'm sure you were maybe apprehensive going there for the first time um what, especially if you've only known one yeah. one church experience for 23 years your whole life yeah um what was it like um it was a very easy transition I never actually like I, I was never moving church I was never planning on going somewhere else it was only that I stayed up at the weekends I thought I'd give it a try to see what it was like and it was so so similar to here it was just as much I felt just as much at home there as I did here mm-hmm. that I just decided why not when I'm up at the weekends go here. It was so familiar, so comfortable. I instantly felt very welcome and didn't really notice many differences. Mm-hmm. So it was a very easy transition to make and mm-hmm. just felt like the right thing to do at the time. While mm-hmm. I was there, I wanted to get more involved. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And obviously you um, you grew up through Movilla primarily as part of the Methodist congregation. Yeah. And you also are connected to Irish Methodism through events and things. Say a little bit about your involvement. Uh, I, every single camp and mission going, I was at it um, so happily. I mm-hmm. loved going. I was at Soulmates, Autumn Soul, Castle Well and Holiday Week. Never missed a year until lockdown happened. And then Tom team as well, team on mm-hmm. mission. So we met a lot of Methodist people through all of those events. So that big Irish so, Methodist family, is very, that's very much your family, you're yeah, part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, whenever you walked into Church of the Resurrection, um, did that feel like something new, something different? Did it feel connected to Irish Methodism that you're familiar with or was it totally different like what was it no I like I always say one of my favorite things about being at this church for so long is the family feel and being a part of that and knowing people and I never wanted to move somewhere else and not know people Mm. but it just so happened when I went in there were so many familiar faces from different events that I've grown up going to and that I've been to and people that I do know really well and um, so like David Rock and Joanne are part of the congregation there and John Alderdice, our previous Methodist minister, um, is a member there and goes there and worships there as well as the Unsworths. So there were mm-hmm. so many Methodist people. So I instantly felt like I was surrounded by people that I knew and I was in a place where I felt very much a part of the mm-hmm. community and the family. And I think that helped in the transition too mm-hmm. because there were familiar faces. So it just yeah. Yeah, worked. Um, so was there anything else about... Uh, going into Sunday worship for the first time that you were nervous about? I was more kind of worried about whether I wouldn't know, do you know, in communion, whenever we have the responses and everything, I didn't really know how they were going to do it because, like I said, I only ever knew the way the Methodists here have done it. However, it was so similar. I knew the words and it didn't feel any different at all, really. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is something I'd always kind of thought about other denominations and other churches how they have different practices of communion and how they do things. But it was very much similar and felt very comfortable to what I knew. (laughs) Uh, One of the really lovely things about communion as well there is they all get up and they stand in a circle around the room and they all um, just take communion, pass it around. And it just feels so lovely. It feels like everyone's just coming together in unity and just sharing together as a family. Mm -hmm. And it's just lovely. It's really nice. It's really special. And it's something I really enjoyed about their communion there, actually. The music also was very familiar to. Um, it was very hymnal, but also then modern. It was a nice mix. And I really enjoy a good classic hymn and also enjoy then a modern song. So I think that it worked really well the way they used both. Mm-hmm. It was never very heavily one or very heavily the other. And they worked very well together and they had a good use of 
their band they have a lovely youth band and then they have James Turner who Mm -hmm. um, is a very good musician and leads worship but then also have a grand piano and a pianist different weeks as well so Mm -hmm. it was very good and I just felt like I got loads out of the worship Mm -hmm. and connected with the different styles in different ways and I just really liked how it worked and the way they did it. And you um your years at Church of the Resurrection were obviously sometime after they had joined together yeah but you also actually worked at the hub not staff but like I had a role as warden you were a warden so, okay yeah. so um you know a bit of the story so can you tell us a bit of the story about how they became a joint Methodist Church of Ireland congregation they had John, John Alderdice went and took a role as Methodist Methodist chaplain after his time here yes yeah. that's the position he went to and then Barry Ford was there as the Church of Ireland chaplain, but both were running the um, same missions on mm. the student campus and were heading up the Church of the Resurrection together as the ministers. So as, as we've been thinking about um, a future as two congregations or a future as one congregation and trying to discern between that, one concern people have had is um, what would we lose? Do you know, would we lose our... Church of Ireland identity? Would we lose our Methodist identity? Um, are there any any challenges that you're aware of in the life of Church of the Resurrection where um, where that has happened? The only thing I can really think of is that originally it was the two ministers, so Barry as Church of Ireland and John as Methodist. John obviously then isn't there as a minister anymore. Yeah, so Barry heads up the church now and he runs it, but he is very much Methodist and Church of Ireland mm-hmm. ordained and leads it as both with mm-hmm. um, a lot of other people then also still involved in the services. Mm-hmm. So it it does work, and mm-hmm. um, maybe not what they had originally planned, but I don't at all feel like the service is very heavily Church of Ireland, mm-hmm. which is what his background would be. There's still just as much Methodist input as there is Church of Ireland. Yeah, I... I don't feel like I I don't have a Church of Ireland background, as I said, I'm Methodist, and at no point do I feel like I'm have been exposed to too much Church of Ireland or <laughs> too much Methodist. I yeah. just really think it works. Well, thank you to uh, Claire for giving us a perspective on a a, a different expression of uh, the Methodist Church and the Church of Ireland working together in one community. Now, we're very uh, conscious it's uh, nearly 20 to 9. You've been sitting on your bottoms on those hard pews for uh, an hour and 40 minutes. So uh, would you like a two-minute comfort break? Yes, I'm seeing some nodding heads. So two-minute comfort break, chance to sort of stand up and stretch uh, if you want. You can't all rush to the toilet at the same time, uh, but just, just two minutes, and then we're going to come back together. We will finish at nine o'clock, because I think that's important for us, but we, we do want to, to do this justice. I appreciate that it's been a, lo- a, a while. We've got four more questions to go, but they're important to ask, because these are your questions that you've been asking as part of this process. So we, we want to do that justice, if that's, if that's okay. So Two minutes, um, get up and stretch. Uh, You'll need to put your mask on if you're moving and going to, to the toilets. Okay, thank you. So, uh, just a, a, a few more uh, questions. Um, David and Heather, um, if I could address this, this question to you. When, when we've been praying about coming uh, together as one congregation, some people have wanted to know and, and expressed the, the question, how, how can that happen? Aren't the Church of Ireland uh, and Methodist Church in Ireland different? Don't we have different beliefs? Um, and e- even if we did believe 98% uh, of, of the same things, isn't that 2% uh, important? Heather, you, you're the chair of the uh, Covenant Council, where the Methodist Church uh, uh, in Ireland and the Church of Ireland talk these kind of things uh, through uh, together. So maybe you could start us off on on addressing this this question of of, of difference. And is there really one? Thank you. Um, So uh, um, 
the Covenant Council is chaired by two folks, one Methodist Presbyterian, uh, again, that sharing. So I wanted to say, you know, when I was thinking about theology, thank you to whoever asked the theology question, mm. <laughs> because it really matters, and it's important that we talk um, these things through. So starting from basics, we all know that we came, we come from the same roots, <laughs> and uh, whether that's the, the, the church through time and eternity, or specifically the Church of England, where John Wesley was, was it was a Church of England uh, minister. So those roots are there, and we continue to have that bedrock of common theology. Um, at the Covenant Council, I was thinking about, well, what are the issues that are discussed? Because that's where those points of difference would be discussed, where that 2% would come to the table. I cannot ever remember a question about the personhood of Jesus or um, God as creator or the work of the Holy Spirit in the world because those things we hold in common, they are not a point of difference. In my experience, the 2% is more about what church looks like. So the conversations that are live at the minute are about who can preside at communion because the Methodist Church would have um, some exceptions to the normal rule that it would be an ordained person that would preside. So in certain tightly defined circumstances, in Methodism, lay folk can preside. That's a point of discussion. And the other live point of discussion at the minute is around ordination. And, you know, how do we think about the ordination, not of each other, Methodist and Church of Ireland, but of the, the wider denominations on this island and beyond, because there are some differences in the way in which we view that. That's it. That's the 2%. It's about what church looks like. And we discuss those things well. We're coming to Bishop Michael, who's the other co-chair, has this picture about Venn diagrams. <laughs> and he says, you know, most of we agree. Mm. And there'll be wee bits on the edges of some of those Venn diagram circles that we might not agree on. But we're in covenant and we'll work together and we can live with a lot of those 2% differences. So that's how I come to this. We're bedded in the, in the same tradition, those core things we have in common. And yeah, there is a 2%, but that's what we can discuss and differ well on. And it may well be that actually those differences are around the edges of the 2%. They're not core to what the core thought this evening has been, which is about faithfulness to God as God leads us together in mission. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's, that's very helpful. David, I wonder if there's anything more that, that you would like to add, for, for example. I mean, Methodists uh, emphasize that the four alls, all need to be saved, all can be saved, all know they are saved, and all can be saved to, to the uttermost. Is there anything that you would like to say about the differences yeah, be between us? One word called four amen. <laughs> amen. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think sort of talk around a 2% difference or 1% or 5% or whatever. The truth is that within each of our denominations, exactly. actually there are, that we interpret things differently, mm. even within our same denomination. Mm. And certainly within Anglicanism worldwide, we interpret things significantly different, differently yeah. at that time. Um, but the important thing is to be united around the four things that we that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we love his word and we want to live under the authority of his word, that we want to do mission, that we want to see people come to Christ. My 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 prayer, my cry for the church would be that we would see God add to his church yes. who are coming to Jesus and you know, I, I know that that's Heather's longing, I know that it's everybody's longing in, in terms of all of us sitting here this evening. So we're, 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 we're at one around all of those things. Yeah, there, there are some things that we, that we do differently, but that's true across our individual denomination. Mm. Yeah. Um, David, I want to ask you specifically about um, beliefs and practices around communion, uh, and you and I have a, a conversation uh, not so very long ago, which I think would be really helpful for people to hear, um, uh, where we talked about kind of 
who can come, how is it done, and those kind of things. And you shared a little bit about your experience at, at Willowfield as well, so it'd be good for people to hear that. Again, local practice will differ, will, will differ from place to place. But certainly, you know, I was rector of Willowfield for 19 years, and in terms of our morning communion services, um, we welcome anyone who you love the Lord, was more than welcome to receive communion. Uh, children came forward with their parents, and it was actually down to parent parental choice whether those children received uh, the elements or didn't. Uh, and I actually think that that's how it ought to be. Parents are the people who nurture their children most in the sense of the faith. So you know, we had an open table in, in, in that sense where, where parents made, made that choice. Mm. In, in our context, most uh, shared their bread with their children. Some didn't. Mm. Was one not a parent's right and another as well? Absolutely not. Uh, it's down again to, it's down again to the local views of mm-hmm. lots of things. Mm-hmm. Actually, baptism. We're against the clock here, so I want to get this last quick. No, no, it's, no, it's really, really helpful. Sorry, I wasn't, I, no, you, you, you spoke for the right amount of time. Thank you. Um, the, um, I want to get to this question because it's the question we've had most often. And it's a very nice question, because, uh, but it's also a very important one. And the question goes like this. We like Alan and Michael. Thank you. Um, we, we like Alan Mike and Michael, and they're working well together, but we all know that they'll not be here forever. So what happens when one or both of them leaves? Um, whether you are a church with just one denomination or a church that belongs to two denominations, there's always that worry about what if we get the wrong person or what if we get the wrong people? Um, and, and how would we make sure that everything... Um, everything that we've, we've talked about and heard about tonight, how, how would we make sure that that was protected and understood and built on by the next leader or leaders? Let me start with that one. So um, I want to talk about what happened when Claire was appointed to the Church on the Hill and Colin was involved in that process. Now, at that point, um, Church on the Hill was appointing one minister, and we're not taking anything for granted in that, looking into the future, however you discern, one minister, two ministers. But what happened there was that together, and it was, um, David was involved, and Bishop Harold was the the bishop at the time, and the primary question that we discussed with the Covenant Church Council was, who's the right person? And denominational identity is actually secondary to that, who do we discern the right person is for this? So whether it's one person, two people, however you discern, I think, I'm not thinking, I'm undertaking that as a Methodist denomination, we would be taking care and attention. If it's a Methodist who's being uh, assigned when you go and a Church of Ireland person is continuing on, in that context, the stationing committee would be really mindful that this is a, co- this is, you know, a congregation of place where that denominational link is important and being worked out. So that would be a significant, significant concern in appointing the right person. Um, in terms of the Church of the Good Shepherd, Monkstown, which was mentioned earlier on, at the minute that uh, is Ruth Patterson uh, is the minister there. And I remember the stationing conversations around that. So the decision had been made that there would be a Methodist minister going in. 
Um, the Church of Ireland was informed all the way through uh, and, uh, and consulted in terms of that uh, appointment. And Ruth's identity was important to that. Now, she's a fantastic minister in her own right, but she also brings to that the fact that she was, and I think still is, a canon in St. Anne's. So there was a person who is Methodist but actually has an understanding of the Church of Ireland, just as um, Claire is Church of Ireland and has a, an understanding of Methodism. So whatever the pattern is going forward, one minister, two ministers, uh, you know, together in partnership in a different way, the denominations will take care to appoint under God how it is discerned the right person in consultation with the congregations. I really want to add to that that uh, you know, personally I would be totally 100% committed the so wanting to make sure that if you were choosing a minister, two ministers, three ministers, whatever, that uh, it's so important to get the right person. Yes. Uh, it really is, in any context, it's really, really important to get the right person. And the last thing that the like of me or anyone else in leadership wants is the wrong person yeah. in a post. But I think we've got to acknowledge that it sometimes does happen. Yeah. Uh, and has happened probably. Certainly it's happened in the Church of Ireland. Maybe the Methodist Church. <laughs> <laughs> Never make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we've got less than right sometimes. Mm. Uh, not very often. Uh, but you know that that's why there's got to go a lot of prayer and concern and listening mm. actually to those who've got responsibility at a local level mm. uh, as well. Uh, and I would be certainly totally, totally, totally in a listening yeah. and wanting to get that back. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I'd like on behalf of all of us to thank all four of you for coming tonight. And I, and I hope that uh, those of you who've been, been listening to this conversation feel maybe reassured by some of the things that have been said, if, if you still had some questions uh, tonight. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask the four of you if, if you would pray uh, for us. We would really appreciate that for you to pray for us uh, as a church as we discern the voice of the Holy Spirit and seek to be obedient to where God uh, is calling us to. But before we do, is, is there anything else... Uh, unscripted that you'd, you'd like to, to say to us uh, as, as we engage with this process and journey? Uh, David, Heather, Claire, or Colin, is there anything else you'd like to, to, to say to, to the congregation uh, or to us? I would simply like to say a word of thanks to both congregations uh, for embarking on this courageous mm. Uh, road that you've been on, and I'd like to say a word of thanks to Michael and to Alan uh, because they didn't have to embark on that road. It may have been they might have had it an easier life, but they haven't in some ways. But under God, they sense that they needed to to, to 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 help you look at this, and I would just like to thank them for that. I'd want to echo that absolutely, and um, to thank, to just to voice thanking God for you as a congregation, um, in terms of because you've kept mission front and center in this, uh, and and your heart that God would be glorified as God leads you forward. Um, I think discernment is one of the most um, exciting and challenging tasks that God trusts us with. Would we discern what God's will is? And you've been willing to, to do that, to journey it step by step with that sense of mission. How, how best can we glorify Jesus in this generation? And to thank God for you um, with Bishop David and to, to promise ongoing prayers as, as you journey on in this. Mm. For sure, I just want to say, you know, I've already said my, I was baptised here, I was brought up here, I have a huge heart for, for my villa, and I do, you know, watch on from a distance to what God is doing, and it's just hugely encouraging to see where you're at as a church, 
and to see all that God is doing in and through you. So that's what I encourage you in that. So whether that future is, is together as one congregation or, or continuing to do what you're doing now um, by, by joining together in some things, but worshipping um, apart in some things. Just be encouraged and, and keep listening to the sermon because we're on a journey and we're still listening and we're still discerning and we're still you know, trying to hear what God's calling us to do. Um, but just be really encouraged by, by what is happening here. Um, because God's at work, and I know that we will, and and do continue to to pray for you, and we're written along from the sidelines, and whatever God calls you calls you into in the future. Um, we'll invite you to pray for us now. Then let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for this place and this people. Mm -hmm. Our prayer would be that the name of Jesus would continue to be glorified and that the life of those who worship in this place in one congregation or two would always and in every aspect point to Jesus. Mm. So we pray for an awareness of your guidance. We pray that you would continue to spark into flame that which you have placed in the hearts of your people, that many would come to living faith in Jesus. Some verses from 1 John. And so now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. And then later verse, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Mm -hmm. May your people in this place live out that identity as precious children of God. Amen. Amen. I want to very simply pray uh, the words of Isaiah chapter 61, just the first few verses, uh, over all of us this evening. May the spirit of the sovereign Lord come upon us. Amen. Anointing us. Bring good news to the poor. Sending us to bind up the broken heart. Sending us to proclaim liberty to the captives. Sending us to proclaim the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Sending us to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God. Sending us to comfort all the Lord. To grant to those who mourn in Zion, giving them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. Yeah. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faith spirit. May this church and community and those who reach from here be called oaks of righteousness. Amen. The planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Building up the ancient ruins, raising up the former devastations, preparing a ruined city and community and cities, the devastation of many generations. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us again, we pray. Anoint us, Lord, for the work of ministry in our day and in our generation. Amen. For Christ's sake. Amen. Lord, I thank you for uh, the church in this place. Lord, for the history, the tradition, 
the faithfulness of people who over many years have just reached out with the love and the, the, the good news story of Jesus to those around them. And Lord, as we and they look to the future and all that you are calling us into. Lord, we pray just for wisdom, for discernment, that we would hear your voice. But Lord, I pray especially um, just for a unity in whatever decision that is made. Lord, I pray for that, that God-given unity. That you would bind them together. That you would bind them together in their love for you. And Lord, in their love for one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, you prayed to your Father, do what you want, not what I want. Help us to follow your example. Help us to do the things that please you and to go the way that you have chosen for us because we love you. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with the desire to do your holy will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Um, I want to finish with something else from the feedback forms, which I think we all need to hear. Um, this process of discernment has been a long journey. Um, it's been a more difficult journey for some. Um, but in all of this, like Heather said earlier, we can do this because we trust God. Here's what someone has written. I continue to pray for the future of the church. But my overall feeling is that whatever decision the church council and select vestry comes to, the Lord will continue to bless the work of Movilla Abbey Church for his service and for his glory. Amen. And we can all say amen to that. Amen. amen. Indeed. Well, we'd like to uh, thank uh, each of our guests for, for coming tonight. Could we put our hands together and thank them for, for coming uh, once again? And thank you to each one of you for, for joining us, for sitting on a, on a hard pew for, uh, for the last two, two hours. Uh, that's, that's been a real sacrifice on a, <laughs> on, a, on a Sunday night. We would ask you to continue to pray for our uh, select vestry and church council who are meeting together again uh, tomorrow night to, to discern and decide uh, God's will on, on our behalf. And as we pray for our neighborhoods uh, uh, and our communities and our local church, as Colin uh, just reminded us and prayed for us, may we all say, Lord, may your will be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming Amen. and uh, good night and God bless.